Welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Unseen Histories. Hello, I'm Artemis, and in today's episode, we're meeting two extraordinarily brave people who formed an unlikely friendship in Nazi Berlin. Encapsulated in the story you're going to hear about today are some of the biggest themes of 20th century history. Multiculturalism, fascism, anti-Semitism, and relations between Muslim and Jewish communities. It's a really emotive story, full of incredible bravery and daring. But in many ways, it's also a very simple story about a man who helped a girl who was in danger. This is the story of Dr. Mohammed Helmi, a Muslim Egyptian doctor living and working in Berlin, who saved the life of a Jewish girl, Anna, when the Nazis came to power. It is the subject of a new book by our guest today, Ronan Steinker. Ronan is a political commentator for Süddeutsche Zeitung, Germany's leading broadsheet newspaper, and he has published a number of works in Germany on the Nazi period. So it was a real privilege to get to speak to Ronan about his new book, Anna and Dr. Helmi, How an Arab Doctor Saved a Jewish Girl in Hitler's Berlin, just last week. Well, Ronan, thanks so much for joining us today on Travels Through Time. This is such an extraordinary story. Um, how did you first come across it? Well, first of all, it's a huge honor for me that you're having me on and that you're putting up with my English. I came across this story um, a few years ago when I was reading the newspaper and I saw a little piece, maybe two or three paragraphs, not more than that, telling um, the story that uh, Yad Vashem, the Israeli Holocaust Memorial um, Institute, had for the first time honored an Arab um, as Righteous Among the Nations. Uh, you know, this program, Righteous Among the Nations, it's like a, um, well, a program to honor people who risked their own lives to save Jews from Nazi um, persecution. Um, and this honor has been bestowed upon, well, more than 25,000 people and a good number of Muslims among them, more than 100, particularly in the Balkans, um, but never to an Arab. And Obviously, for well reasons of present day politics, um, this was um, particularly interesting. And this was something that made the news not only in Israel, but internationally. And so I read this in a German newspaper and I was well interested. And that's that's nice. That's a nice little, <laughs> nice little story. And then I continued to read and discover that this Arab um, doctor who saved um, Jews did so in Berlin. And this was intriguing to me because I had no idea that well, Arabs um, were able to live that freely and that securely um, in Berlin during Nazi times. Um, so that was interesting. And then I continued to read and I discovered that um, Yad Vashem had um, extended an invitation to the um, well surviving family of this Arab hero, um, asking, asking them to come to Jerusalem and to receive this honor and to be applauded. And they said no. They said they would rather not have anything to do with um, Yad Vashem, with Israel, or to put it bluntly, with Jews. Mm -hmm. And so in those two paragraphs in that you know, tiny newspaper piece, there was so much to unpack. There was so much um, closeness and trust in the past between Jews and Muslims. Um, and here in Berlin, the city that I live in, and at the same time, so much um, distance and, and um, well, un unableness, inability to speak with one another, that, um, well, I was intrigued. Definitely. And once you decided that you wanted to find out more about the story, what was your research process like? I imagine that it's quite difficult to get a hold of some of the documents from this time because it's, I don't know, I always get the impression that the whole period's shrouded in a lot of secrecy. And so, yeah, what, what was the research process like? Um, the Nazis uh, had a um, very bureaucratic dictatorship, so there's a lot of paper trail. Um, and a lot of the uh, documents, particularly from the Nazi foreign ministry, are um, well preserved to this day. So I was able to go to archives and to find actually quite a lot of write, uh, written um, documentation. Um, also, the Arabs living in Berlin were of particular political interest to the Nazis, so there was actually great deal of detail uh, on them 
And then um, I traveled to Yad Vashem. I traveled, you know, to to um, different archives. But just as importantly, I boarded planes and I flew to Cairo, and I flew to New York, and I um, made an effort to meet the family on the one side of the Arab hero and on the other side of the Jewish family who was saved in those days, and to get their oral history, to get their family documents, photographs, and piecing all these little um, elements together like a jigsaw puzzle, um, slowly the story um, came to life. Yeah, and it's so wonderful that you spoke to the the families of um, of the two sort of protagonists that we're about to meet, because it's really a piece of, it feels very much like a piece of living history. You know, you talk in the final chapter of the book about this, this recent history, um, and how the families of um, the families of the two characters who, like I say, we're about to meet kind of feel about it now. I thought that was something really striking that you don't often, you, you we often forget about history, that it's it can be very, very present and very live kind of. But without further ado, could you introduce us to the two protagonists of this story, Anna and Dr. Halmi? Yeah, just to, to um, touch upon what you what you just said. Yes, um, it's it's easy for us to forget history that is only a hundred years ago when it's so um, overshadowed by more recent history, as in this case. I'm 38 years old, I'm Jewish, I'm, I live in Germany, and I grew up with this notion that um, Jews and Muslims or Jews and Arabs are somehow inherently antagonistic, or that there's something in the culture or even in the religion that sets them apart um, as if you know, there's, this is some kind of uh, law of nature. And probably the generation before me or even the two generations before me have grown up with the same notion. And this is rooted in 20th century politics, you know, Middle Eastern politics, Israel, Palestine. And I think it's really valuable to, to go back a little further to the beginning of the 20th century, to the 19th century, and you know, if not to shatter the prejudices that um, we have today, at least to put a crack in them. And this is um, kind of the, the, the beauty of this story or what, what attracted me to this story. Mm. And, and so the two protagonists we have on the one hand, um, Dr. Mohammed Helmi, who's um, an Egyptian and who came to Berlin at the beginning of the 20th century in 1921 as a student. Uh, he was one of a large number of Arab um, rich kids who came to Berlin to, to go to university. Um, which was a popular thing to do with um, rich families in Cairo, in Damascus, in Marrakesh. Um, if you had the chance to send your son to university in, in Europe, then you wouldn't choose London, you wouldn't choose Paris. Why? Because those were the capitals of the colonial oppressors. But Berlin had this image, at least in the Arab world, as um, well a fairly um, innocent <laughs> empire. <laughs> And, um, and one that was you know, fairly friendly to the Arab world. And um, the, the regime in, um, in Germany, the Kaiser's regime, and then the, the Weimar uh, democracy of uh, post-1918 um, tried to make use of this image and tried to portray itself as a natural friend of the Arab world. And they extended invitations to the Arab world. They gave generous grants to young Arabs to come to Berlin and um, study or do, the, do their doctorate. And so um, there was a sizable community um, of a few hundred and at some point a few thousand young, highly educated, affluent um, and um, polyglot um, Arabs um, who were well, not only were culturally very active, they had poetry readings, they had magazines, at one point, there were 12 Arab language magazines uh, in, in Berlin, um, but they were also um, well, politically active and they um, had debates. Um, yeah, and so, so Mohammed Helmi was one of them. Um, he came at a fairly young age, right after school, um, studied medicine in Berlin at the Friedrich Wilhelm University. He came uh, from a rich background and um, he found himself in a country that was in turmoil. Um, Germany at the time, well, was a, a young democracy, was just uh, like a toddler stage democracy, um, was riddled with um, inflation and um, money that was uh, worth a lot on Monday was worth nothing on Wednesday. 
people were losing their entire savings. Um, rich people were um, plunging into poverty. Um, and the only really people who were free from this, um, this, this problem were foreigners who had um, money from abroad. And so these young Egyptian or Syrian um, guys um, with their parents sending them money were in a position that they could um, you know, afford <laughs> To, to, to really have a good time in the jazz clubs and in the theaters and in, in nightlife. And um, so he had, a, he had an amazing time uh, and um, he and his, his um, friends that he well, shared this experience with, um, to them Berlin really was a, was a playground and was a, a place to be um, discovered. Mm. Yeah, and you get the impression that he kind of fell in love with Berlin, don't you? He... Which I think is easy. <laughs> in yeah. Berlin, particularly, I mean, these are the the, the roaring twenties, the golden twenties, a, a time which which um, well, the arts were exploding in Berlin. This was a, a city of of jazz, of the cinema, um, of art. Um, many young people after the um, well, the traumatic and and. Uh, and deeply uh, unsettling experience of the First World War were looking to um, new inspiration. They were, you know, they, they had enough of, of Western and capitalist and aristocratic culture. Now they wanted to, um, to, to look for uh, new sources of wisdom. So there was like new age philosophies were blossoming. People were um, going to the countryside and painting each other in the nude. <laughs> and there was, um, there was all these like, new ideas and um, and literature. Um, and there was a huge interest within German society, or at least within the younger generation, in um, non-Western culture. And there was a, like a, a group of, of German writers really enamored with Islam, with um, Buddhism. Uh, oh, to just name one, uh, a novelist, Hermann Hesse, with his novel Siddhartha, you know, wrote about Buddhism and, and um, had a bestseller with this. So this was really a time where um, Arab visitors, expats in Germany, uh, couldn't have had it better. I read a, a um, comparison recently that Islam in those days in Germany had a similar um, image to um, Buddhism in 1980s California. <laughs> it was hip. It was um, something that I'm not sure everybody really um, profoundly understood or really read about, but it was considered something um, you know wise and attractive. And mm. the the Bohemians, the artists, the young intellectuals um, were attracted to it. Mm. I love that. I love that um, comparison. And what about Anna? The um, the Jewish girl who at the center of this story. Um, Anna was uh, a girl who grew up without a father. Her um, mother and her grandmother had a, a fruit store on Alexanderplatz, which is a very good address um, in the center of Berlin. So they were um, very busy um, in their daily business and very um, uh, caught up in it. And they had very little time and very little warmth for Anna. So um, she had a difficult childhood, even without Nazi oppression and without anti-Semitism. And when that came um, on top, and then her, her childhood and her youth became even more um, difficult, of course. And um, Anna's big um, fortune or big, big luck was that uh, Dr. Helmi became her family's um, doctor. And uh, he, he was the person that her mother and her grandmother would turn to looking for advice, looking for support. And um, Helmi, who didn't have any children, he had a, a German partner who later became his fiance, but they never had any children. He developed a, um, well, an emotional attachment or a, um, like a sentimental relationship to Anna, which you can probably compare to like a, um, an uncle niece relationship. Uh, he, he looked out for her, he helped her. And when she, well, told him that she, she would love to be a nurse and that this was her, her dream. And that unfortunately with um, Nazi laws, she was not able to, to pursue this dream. Then he um, came up with an idea to help her to you know, show her the ropes a little bit and explain or to, to allow her to work in his doctor's practice with him. Mm. 
So that takes us um, right up to the year that I think we're going to travel travel through time to today. So Ronan, if you could travel through time to any year, what year would you choose? Well, um, definitely I would not <laughs> choose Nazi time and definitely not not Berlin. But um, but just to to um, continue this story and to really bring us to the center of why it why it's such a fascinating story and and um, why I think it merits a book and not just uh, an article. Uh, in 1943, the um, mosque in Berlin um, was still a place of um, of culture. Was still a place where people were not only were worshiping or, or praying, but were um, well celebrating poetry and 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 the arts. Um, and in 1943, the um, Nazis placed this mosque under the control of one of their friends uh, in the Arab world, which is uh, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Now, whereas the um, Arabs who had been living in Berlin for a number of years at this time were mostly very friendly towards the city's Jewish population. This guest of the Nazis was absolutely not. He was um, an aggressive anti-Semite, somebody who, um, well, from his, uh, from his, his, his workplace in, in Jerusalem had applauded the Nazis every success in the, in the recent years. Um, somebody who had um, echoed the uh, Nazis um, obscene uh, version of, of uh, anti-Semitism, you know, likening Jews to uh, parasites. Um, in Arabic, basically, if you if you read his speeches from the 1930s, there are use of Goebbels um, verbatim, just in Arabic. And somebody who even pleaded with the Nazis not to spare Jewish children, you know, who would who would um, who would tell them that if you spare Jewish children, they will be the Jewish. Um, uh, soldiers of the future. So a dangerous and, and, and hateful and powerful uh, person. And he fled to Berlin in 1941 as a guest of honor of the Nazis and of the SS. And he was now put in charge of the mosque. And if we look at this microcosm of, of um, Arab or Muslim life in Berlin, you could really not imagine a more stark contrast. The Arabs that had been living in Berlin had been uh, welcomed with open arms by the entire Berlin population, but particularly by the Jews, um, which yeah is not is not surprising on a theological level. Islam and um, and Judaism have a lot more in common than um, than the two have with Christianity. If you look at the three religions that go back to um, Abraham, then really Christianity is the odd one out. I mean, Judaism is a very uh, puristic, uh, stringent monotheism. There is one God and full stop. And then um, well, Christianity expands this concept considerably. There is a son of God, there is a trinity, there is a, a, a number of saints. Um, and then uh, Islam as the, the third uh, chronologically really more or less goes back to the um, basics and, and returns to a, to a considerable degree to the puristic monotheism of, of Judaism. And then also on a, like a more base, on a more um, mundane level, the two have a lot in common. The idea that food is something to be um, considered religiously uh, is, is um, yeah, halal for um, Muslims and kosher for Jews is a very mm. similar concept or the circumcision of boys. And so it's it came naturally to um, Jews in Berlin to see um, these um, Muslim expats as people that are close to them and that they could um, trust. Um, also in, in like German Christian culture, there'd always been a um, romantic idealization of ancient Greece and ancient Rome as the, the cradles of, of European civilization. And within the Jewish minority, there had always been a very romantic uh, view of Andalusia, of mm -hmm. the, the time when in um, Spain, uh, under Arab rulership, the Jews were, you know, a little less uh, persecuted than they were, or a great deal less persecuted than they were in the rest of Europe. So this is also something that had been kept as a fond memory, like the golden age of, of, of um, Jewish culture in Europe. 
So um, yeah, Jews and, and Muslims had really um, had close relations in the 1920s in, in Berlin. Uh, and in this mosque, and this is why, why I chose this scene, in this mosque, the manager who had, who had organized uh, community life had been a convert from Judaism, a man named Hugo Marcus, a novelist um, by day, had um, worked, actually, I should say that other way, by the way, um, a man named Hugo Marcus, a novelist by profession, had, um, had adopted Islam as his religion and had um, made a point of saying that it's not converting, but rather it's expanding your Jewish horizon because um, to, to, um, or to include Islamic uh, teaching in your, um, in, in your, in your outlook, um, doesn't mean taking anything away from Judaism, but just means adding a few more centuries of wisdom to it. So a very interesting um, perspective. He was the, the, the central person in this, in this um, mosque next to the imam. And um, the mosque had been a place where mixed couples had been married. The imam in the 1920s had uh, overseen these ceremonies. And now this a community, uh, this Muslim um, mosque was placed under the control of this radical anti-Semite. Mm. So you've given us some of the fascinating background of the of the history between the Jewish and, and Muslim communities in Berlin. Um, so we're, I just want to kind of get to almost like the, if we could imagine ourselves there, it's 1943, we're in the Berlin mosque. What kind of building is it? If we were to walk through it, what would we, what would we see? It's an explosion of colors. There's orange, there's red, there's aquamarine. From the outside, it looks like a miniature version of the Taj Mahal in India. So it's a very, um, well, Indian Pakistani um, architectural style, not the kind of, um, more clear, more geometrical um, Egyptian Sunni um, style, but rather the, the um, Middle Eastern or, or today's Pakistan. Um, um, in this mosque, people had been um, you know, sharing trays of tea and of, of sweets uh, at ceremonies. Um, there had been regular dance uh, presentations. So it was a really colorful and really um, and really um, impressive building. And it still uh, can be visited today in, in the south of Berlin. This is the first um, mosque in Germany. And uh, for many years, it was the only mosque in Germany. And at the time that we're speaking of 1943, this is the only mosque. Mm. You've, you've described so beautifully about the um, how this mosque was like a kind of cultural epicenter of intellectual and kind of religious fusion almost that there was it was a place where people could come together and share ideas um and rather than being separate but that's so strongly contrasted by this character that we now we now find in the mosque could you talk a bit about the relationship between the mufti of jerusalem and the nazis what other than their mutual anti-semitism obviously what else kind of um, bonded them together as as political allies well, for the mufti the uh, nazis were his protectors this was his his ticket to um, having some kind of protection because, um, well, Jerusalem was under British rule and his support for the Nazis put him in danger. Um, and for the Nazis, he was seen as a useful idiot. He was put to use as a propaganda tool. They um, tasked him with producing radio broadcasts for the Arab speaking world in which he should rally up support for the Nazi cause and convince people that um, if the Nazis came to North Africa or to um, other um, Muslim lands, then, then they should be viewed as uh, liberators and as friends of the, um, of the Muslims. The uh, propaganda um, was that Nazis and Muslims should be natural allies against common uh, enemies, which is the French, the British and the Jews. And um, yeah, both the Mufti and the Nazis played heavily <laughs> on this tune. Um, the Nazis went so far as to uh, really swallow their racism or to, uh, to at least be silent for a little bit for strategic reasons. Because, I mean, if you look at uh, Mein Kampf, this book by Hitler, there's a 
great deal of, of racism uh, also against um, Arabs and against people from North Africa. Um, and and there are, there are, there's a number of really obscene and, and disrespectful comments, but in the moment when the Nazis um, came to power and were thinking of, um, you know, in strategic terms of um, which uh, countries on the um, on the borders of Europe um, they should they they could conquer or they would they would uh, need to conquer, um, they they realized that it would be of strategic value to to have some friends in the Arab world, and that's really the only reason why they. Um, played or they, they they tried to portray themselves as, as friends of Islam and they gave some really um, flowery um, respectful speeches um, praising the um, manliness uh, of Islam and um, the natural um, kinship between Islam and the Germanic uh, race um, and it even goes so far that that Hitler um, complained once in one of his, his um, table speeches that um, um, Europe, if it hadn't been Christianized um, in the Middle Ages, would be stronger to uh, resist um, invaders from the East and the West because uh, Christianity being uh, like a, a soppy and, and, uh, um, and sentimental religion uh, wasn't as manly as Islam. So there's a good deal of projection and of um, well, distortion uh, and of, of, of cherry picking. Mm. Um, and, and so th these two unlikely allies um, have, a, have a common interest. And, and this does relate this bit of history um, and this interesting political alliance. It really relates a lot into Dr. Helmy's story. And um, there's a really interesting bit in the book where it's clear that he, he's working at a hospital and it's clear that his Nazi colleagues at the hospital don't really know what to make of him because there's a kind of, there's a race, there's a racist reaction that they're having to him because he's Arab. Um, but that's not quite, that's kind of enough to get him in a bit of hot water. But then this political uh, background, it gets him out of the hot water in the end. I found that, I found that really interesting. It kind of illustrates the, the situation or the, the, um, inherent uh, contradictions in the um, Nazi policy towards Muslims. So um, yes, he was a foreigner. He was um, from, you know, from outside of Europe even. And um, he absolutely was not respected by his uh, fellow German and, and Nazi uh, doctors. Um, and uh, yet whenever he, um, whenever they, they made an effort to get rid of him, he would uh, cite political support and he would um, he would receive that support by the German foreign ministry, by the diplomats who basically told the stooges at the bottom to, um, well, to, to, to ignore their sentiment and to think of the larger picture that Germany needs friends in the Arab world. And um, Dr. Helmi was very talented in playing this. Uh, he pretended that he was from a family with a lot of political influence like understanding the larger political picture, he portrayed himself as the the, um, the son of a um, well, powerful military family, um, which was absolutely not not <laughs> so very true. But it was very effective uh, because um, because that way uh, the Nazis respected him and um, and they tried to to pull him to their side. And um, when when the Nazis um, started uh, when well, they came to power and they, they persecuted Jews and expelled them from their jobs. And, and um, he was uh, somewhat surprised initially that they didn't do the same thing to him, but that instead they, um, well, they kept him in his job and they even promoted him. And they were, they were really interested um, and, and visibly so um, in having them on their team. And I think that leads us on perfectly to the second scene that we're going to visit in 1943. Where would you like to go? Where are we going? Where are we going next? We're going now to the doctor's practice where Dr. Helmi, who is now no longer working in a hospital, but has been promoted to a, a private doctor's practice where he's treating patients. This is in a fairly well-to-do part of Berlin called Charlottenburg in, in the west of the city. And um, in 1943, he is visited by um, a group of Gestapo officers and they barge into his doctor's practice 
and tell them that they're looking for a Jewish girl who has gone to ground in order to escape deportation. And this girl is Anna, the second protagonist of the book, who at this time is about 16 years old and she's um, gone missing. The Nazis have started deporting the Jewish population of Berlin in uh, October 1941. And fairly soon after that, uh, she disappeared and her parents uh, pretended that uh, she had she'd, um, uh, taken a train to Romania to visit family. Um, the Nazis mistrusted this story and they assumed there was foul play. And um, well, this was one of the many places in Berlin where they um, well, went about um, ransacking apartments or, or looking behind, looking in drawers, looking behind curtains to see if, if somebody was hiding. And so um, these officers barge in, they're very um, strict in the way that they talk to not only Dr. Helmy, but also his young female assistant who is sitting at the reception, who has a headscarf, who is also a Muslim, and who treats them with utmost um, politeness and, and, and is very helpful to them. And she says, of course, the doctor will help you. And, um, you know, may I, may I show you around? And what else can I get you? And she's, um, she behaves as is probably expected of her as a young uh, female assistant um, and absolutely um, fulfills every wish that the Gestapo has. And uh, so does Dr. Helmy when he when he comes uh, to greet them. He greets the Gestapo officers with Heil Hitler. And of course, you know, I will help you. I'm, I'm happy to be of any service. Um, but um, Anna is nowhere to be found. And um, so the Gestapo officers leave empty handed once again. And the beauty of this scene and why I've chosen this scene is that the um, Gestapo officers have been duped. The, um, the play that um, Dr. Helmi has been um, staging for quite some time now is that he is hiding Anna and he's hiding her as his Muslim assistant. Um, he's given her a new name. She now goes by the name of Nadia. She wears a headscarf and she pretends to be um, a member of his family. She pretends to be his niece, um, an Arab, uh, a Muslim uh, young woman. And so um, for, for quite some time, the two have been um, you know, putting on this theatre and quite successfully. Yeah, what a great scene. I mean, it gives me goosebumps to think about how she must have felt to speak to the Gestapo who were looking for her and, and how composed she must have been. It's really, really extraordinary. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, one of the things that's so wonderful and kind of fascinating about this story is that she's basically the strategy was to hide in plain sight is that is that how how kind of common is that of the stories that we know from this time was it was it um how kind of outlandish an idea was it of dr helmy's to hide anna in plain sight so there are a number of uh, stories of, of um jewish kids being adopted by christian families and people saying oh she's my unlawful daughter or she's my niece from a different city um, but still this story is, is even more outlandish uh, she's um, hiding not as an inconspicuous um, uh, you know Christian uh, girl who, who kind of blends into the scenery but she's hiding she's hiding in a very visible and very exposed place mm. uh, she knows that the the Arab community um, is is being close uh, very closely watched by the Nazis. Mm. And um, I mean, I talked to her children who live in, in New York today, um, and they describe Anna as somebody who uh, didn't know the word fear. And I, I think that, you know, to some degree, that's children being respectful and, and admiring of their mother. But I'm sure that to some degree that is true. Um, she must have had a talent to at least swallow her fear in, in, in moments like these and to be um, creative and improvising and playing a role. Mm. Um, only it helped her that in those days, um, people in Germany weren't as acquainted with the Arab language as they are today. Um, probably it was enough for her to have you know, a few phrases and that, that way she could pretend that, to speak Arabic. Probably she could also claim to have grown up in Germany, which explained her um, you know, flawless German and her maybe lack of, of perfect Arabic. 
Um, but still, I mean, this is a feat <laughs> that I would uh, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall to see her her in action. I mean, what a um, what a masterful um, piece of acting. Mm, mm, absolutely. So, how did um, Helmi and Anna come up with this plan? Where, where are Anna's um, Anna's mother and her stepfather at this point? Unfortunately, her mother and her stepfather hadn't hadn't been helpful at all. Um, her stepfather was uh, non-Jewish, and that's why her mother and her stepfather were, you know, a little less bad position than Jews. You know, the the um, Nazis' um, persecution um, kind of spared um, mixed marriages, uh, at least until some until until a, a point. Um, but they. Didn't have ideas how to how to hide Anna. They didn't have um, ideas like in the case of Anne Frank with a, a, um, a secret apartment behind a, a cupboard or something like that. And they didn't have ideas where to where to send her. They didn't have family to send her to. Really, it was Helmi who um, first of all told her family not to lose any time and to come up with a solution quickly. Um, in in um, autumn of 1941, he was basically the one who told the family, don't believe the Nazis when they tell you you're going to work in Eastern Europe. Um, don't believe them when they tell you pack your suitcase, um, look through their lies and don't lose any time and go to ground immediately. And he was also the one who came up with this idea um, to, to hide her in plain sight and to or to hide her between behind lies, <laughs> behind uh, behind this this play. And you mentioned earlier that Anna had told Helmi that she wanted to be, um, she was interested in becoming a nurse. And that was something else that I kind of loved about this story as well, that she's also sort of learning, um, she's learning uh, skills. It's almost like the most kind of high stakes internship you could possibly imagine. She she is kind of learning from him and they, they develop an incredibly strong um, bond with each other, don't they? Absolutely, because they are now um, in a situation where they depend on one another, where they share an incredibly dangerous secret. Um, and, well, they, their um, play is only as good as um, the, the play that the other partner is, is delivering. So sometimes in his doctor's practice where, well, people from, from West Berlin would come um, not knowing... Uh, of this secret sometimes in the doctor's practice he would um, shout things to his uh, apparent muslim assistant in arabic and she would respond by yes yes <laughs> just to, to give the impression that she understood what he was saying um, and that way they would they would kind of um, give this this impression mm. and, and then she learned to to take um, urine samples to take blood samples to analyze these things not on a very high uh, uh, level but um, yeah, she she basically uh, step by step became a nurse, and that way was able to even fulfill her dream uh, mm. for some time. And just before we um, we move on to um, the next scene, I wanted to talk a bit about um, Dr. Helmi's because uh, he, he continues to treat Jewish um, patients throughout the war, and he has he. I kind of wanted to talk a bit about his personal relationship with the Jewish community because there's a really um, wonderful description of when he first arrives in Ber in the book there's a really wonderful description of him first arriving in Berlin and the hospital that he goes to work at and the Jewish um, colleagues that he had there um, he personally um, feels very close to the Jewish community doesn't he yes he has a lot in common with his uh, Jewish uh, colleagues and um, this is a time where the elite uh, in Germany is very nationalist um, in the justice system, in politics, and also in medicine. And the good hospitals don't take um, non-white, uh, non-Christian doctors, at least not to prestigious positions. So um, for Helmi, his chance uh, at a career is to go to a hospital um, with majority Jewish doctors. And this is a hospital in a very... Um, a rough neighborhood in a, a part of town called Moabit, um, where you know, there's a lot of unemployment, there's a lot of alcoholism, and where basically all the Jewish um, doctors um, well come together to um, to uh, run a hospital. It's not nominally or officially a Jewish hospital. It's just de facto the one hospital where they have a 
have, have a break, have a chance. And this is also the hospital where he is um, welcomed and mm -hmm. where he's able to have a career. Um, there's a very prestigious, very famous uh, Jewish um, professor of, of medicine, Klemperer, who um, kind of takes him under his wing and, and um, helps him out. And there's a, well, really a group of, of friends or a, um, well, a, a little group of uh, doctors who trust one another, um, who are um, mostly Jewish. And Dr. Helmi is seen as one of their, uh, one of their own. Hi there, it's Peter here. Unseenhistories.com is now three months old and already it is packed full of enticing, illuminating and excellently presented historical material. If you give the site a visit today, you'll see many beautifully illustrated excerpts of books that we've featured on Travels Through Time. There's excerpts from Malcolm Gaskell's Ruin of All Witches, Nigel Pickford's Samuel Pepys and the Strange Wrecking of the Gloucester and Gary Shaw's Egyptian mythology, along with many others as well. For those of you who like maps, you might want to check out the utterly compelling series of pieces on the Battle of Fredericksburg in 1862. That was a crucial moment in the American Civil War, along with a range of fabulously colourised images from Jordan Lloyd. It really is history for our times. UnseenHistories.com So, Ronan, where are we going for our final scene um, in 1943? So it's the 10th of June, 1943. The uh, place that we're at now is the apartment where Dr. Mohamed Helmi lives with his um, German um, fiancé or partner. Um, it's also in the rough neighborhood of Moabit, so close to the, um, to, close to the hospital where he used to work. It's nighttime and there's a knock at the door. At this time, he has already been hiding Anna for some time, pretending that she is his niece, pretending that she is a Muslim like himself, and she lives with him and his um, fiance. Um, and then when this knock at the door comes, she is um, worried because um, uh, who could that be? And it's a friend of Helmi's. It's a, another Arab who had um, spent the past years uh, you know, working alongside Helmi, um, and he's invited him for a secret meeting and for a secret ceremony. And Helmi has developed a plan to, um, to get Anna out of the country. And the first um, step towards this is to have her convert to Islam in this uh, evening. Mm. And the, the beauty of this scene is that um, Helmi's friend, um, called Galal, uh, has brought some official certificates um, from the Islamic Central Institute of Berlin, which is now also under the control of the um, Nazi-friendly Mufti of Jerusalem, who we've already mentioned, um, and who is definitely not uh, anyone inclined to help Jews. But um, Galal, who works also in this Islamic Central Institute, so he works alongside the Mufti, Galal has stolen one of these certificates. It even has the, the name and the official um, um, letterhead of the Mufti. And um, he kind of uses the name and uses the, the power that the Mufti has to um, certify that Anna is now uh, converting to Islam. Mm. And could you um, describe a bit about this scene? What, what would be involved in the kind of... Um, in the ritual between these three people? What, what, what's involved in a conversion to Islam? So I would imagine a solemn uh, atmosphere. The door is locked, the curtains are drawn, probably they sit down. Perhaps they ask Anna to read the Islamic creed. Uh, there is um, only one God and Muhammad is his messenger. Um, perhaps they didn't, perhaps they you know, just, just signed the document and nothing more because this was not essentially a religious um, ceremony that anybody took um, literally, this was a humanitarian gesture. And um, Helmi, even though he was from a Muslim background, was never a religious person. Um, he had respect for religion and he would, you know, until the end of his days, consider himself a Muslim. But um, he never cared, for example, for his German fiance to convert to Islam. This was never important to him. So I doubt that he, you know, he cared 
for whether Anna took this literally or whether she just played this, um, played along uh, for the sake of saving her, her life. And also Anna, uh, at this point, she's a teenager, but uh, later in life, um, she would always consider herself as Jewish. So she never saw this as a real uh, act of conversion uh, to Islam. She was from a, a Jewish family that was also not particularly heavy on, on religion. They had Jewish festivals at home. They celebrated Pesach, for example, or Passover in, in the spring, where um, Jews commemorate the exodus from Egypt, um, but, uh, or, or Shabbat. Um, um, but also her family would, um, would celebrate Easter and they would uh, have uh, meatballs uh, with milk, which is a, a, a Hungarian dish uh, that her mother um, prepared, which is about as unkosher as you can imagine. <laughs> it's, um, so this was a family with a relaxed attitude towards religion. And um, this didn't change on that evening. This is a ceremony um, which was uh, designed to uh, trick once again uh, the Nazis and also the Nazi friendly Mufti. Mm. I love um, I love the way you describe it as a, a human humanitarian action. I think that's um, it's such a wonderful idea. I wanted to talk a bit about Galau because um, Helmi seems to be able to draw on this um, quite extensive network of friends and allies um, in Berlin at the time. Um, and I really wanted to talk, I wanted to delve a bit more into that because it's almost feels like a, a kind of resistance network. Um, people who are literally, in the case of Galau, working, you know, right, like working with uh, Nazis or working with um the Mufti of Jerusalem, um, and yet still finding these ways to resist and to um, to help um, Anna and help Jewish people. Um, how did Helmi uh, cultivate that network? Yes, I think network is is well put. Uh, he had friends, um, Arab friends, who were uh, ballet dancers. He had a friend who was the manager of a jazz club. He had friends who were doctors like him. And, um, and friends in politics uh, who, like Galal, were working, or at least pretending to, um, work for Nazi propaganda with a view to the Arab world. The Nazis were so um, desperate to, to find support or to rally up support in the Arab world that um, they, they gave jobs to anybody who spoke Arabic. And among them were you know, a good deal of people like uh, Helmi, who remembered that Jews had been the ones who helped them, who'd been most welcoming to them, who'd been um, extending solidarity to them uh, in a time when, when, when that was necessary for them. And well, who now used this opportunity to return the favor to some degree. So, um, I won't give anything, I won't give everything away. There's a few more uh, and even more um, creative uh, uh, stunts that, that Helmi um, goes to um, after this, this conversion ceremony. Um, and he, he uses this, this, um, this network in very creative ways. Yes, I, I, yeah, I love that. And I agree that we shouldn't give away too much of the ending because it is um, the last, the last kind of bit of the book is, um, is absolutely thrilling <laughs> to read. Um, so I definitely recommend that listeners go and find out what, what happens. I don't want to just spoil uh, the, the suspense, but I want to say that obviously if you start telling a lie um, and you do that for months and months on end, you, you play this, this, this kind of character. Of course, every time that somebody catches you with a lie or with, with some, something that is not entirely true, then you have to top, you have to uh, compensate it with a new lie. And so this mm. building, this construction of, of lies has to become more complex and more intricate uh, uh, and more adventurous. As we go along. Yeah, and it, and it almost seems like too obvious a point to make, but I feel perhaps we should discuss it is what were Helmi and Anna risking by by doing this? I, I found it incredibly striking in the book when you talk about they were they were operating in the same area where just um, like minutes away uh, was the train station where Jewish people were being sent to Auschwitz. Is that is that right? That's absolutely right. This was uh, basically in the same neighborhood. So um, this was under their eyes. They always, uh, you know, they, they could always see um, what was uh, at stake for them. And also the house that they were living in was one where a number of, of other tenants were Jewish. This was a, a neighborhood with a lot of Jewish um, Berliners. 
And they uh, witnessed not once, but a number of times, uh, the Gestapo deporting people from there, um, knocking at 6 a.m. and pulling somebody down to the street and um, making them disappear. So um, they were very aware of the danger that they were in. For Helmi, the, um, well, the, 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 the risk was that he would be uh, at least put in jail, which you know, under, under the circumstances of those days um, meant bodily harm and meant uh, danger to his life. Um, if not worse, if not uh, you know, a, a real um, a sentence uh, to his life, if not capital punishment. And uh, for Anna, obviously, the moment that she would have been discovered, she would have been deported. She would have been put in detention and um, on a train. Mm. Well, like, like I say, I think listeners should read the book to find out how they get out of it. Um, but the one question that I wanted to ask you um, before we head back to the present um, is in the last chapter of your book um, you talk about the tensions that exist today between um, Muslim and Jewish people and we've spoken about it a bit at the beginning of this um, conversation I was really struck by a comment that someone you interviewed made about the word tolerance and what does that word mean Um, and I think they say that um, tolerance implies that I'll put up with what you have to say but if you disappeared off the face of the planet I wouldn't really care What's happening in this story between Dr. Helmy and Anna, it goes so much further than just tolerance, doesn't it? Yeah, tolerance is a very ambiguous word because it implies uh, that something unpleasant is being tolerated. Um, Acceptance is the much better word. And I think, um, yes, they saw one another as equals. Uh, um, And Helmy, just like many other Arabs in Berlin at the time, um, saw... Jews as their brethren. Um, I ask myself sometimes when I research this story, uh, what what actually drove Helmi, what motivated him to take these crazy risks, which you know he wouldn't have had to do, uh, and many others didn't. Um, and of course, there's this humanitarian element, definitely. Um, but and maybe in a like stereotypical story, that would be it. That we just pure moral reasons and then every choice that he makes is is motivated purely by that but i think there's a there's reality is a bit murkier and there's a a second um motive which which um, at least goes along with that and that is um a sense of pride Uh, helmy was a highly educated highly intelligent person who took pride in his status as a doctor of medicine and then in 1933 when the nazis came to power and his Jewish colleagues were all um, well expelled from from hospital, uh, stripped of their jobs, and replaced by Nazi thugs, really, who who wouldn't have had those medical positions uh, on merit, would never have had a chance to become a leading doctor, but just because of their party affiliation, were now um, gifted with these uh, with these uh, jobs. Um, to help me, that was like a, a professional insult. <laughs> he was—he saw himself as surrounded by by idiots, and um, there's there's a, a degree of cockiness to the way he behaved. Um, one at one time, he describes uh, looking back how um, people would greet him with Heil Hitler, and he would respond with "Good morning," which mm. which was a clear gesture that he didn't respect their uh, their politics. Mm. And um, at another time, he at least claimed that he would um, that he would uh, uh, say cheeky things about uh, leading Nazi figures and um, um, make fun of them. Um, really taking risks, and that is not motivated by a, a cool assessment of what makes sense rationally. That that is driven to some degree by, um, by 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 pride, I think, mm. and a very strong sense of. I mean, I know you said that you don't think it's um, entirely about just doing what's right, but a sense that what was happening was wrong, and it was being you know, and that that needed to be stood up against. Something that really struck me. Yeah, that's the moral um, side. And then also to, to be able to trick the Nazis for such a long time and to uh, put up this illusion and to have them believe it um, must have also um, well been, been good for somebody who's, who's, who's proud and who um, kind of takes um, 
solace or takes even some pleasure from seeing uh, himself in a position of superiority. Mm. So Ronan, just before we head back to the present um, from Nazi Berlin, um, you're allowed to bring back an object with you from this time. What object would you like to bring back? I would love to um, go to the the jazz clubs um, of Berlin of the 1930s. Um, Up until even the early 1940s, they were still raging with life and they were a place of resistance to the Nazis' puritanism. And they were run by Arabs to a large degree. Arabs were basically the ones who brought jazz um, to life in Berlin. Um, the names of the like leading jazz clubs uh, were Arabic, like El Sherbini, El, El Shah, which means the Orient uh, in English. Um, they were run by Arabs and they were um, like a safe haven for Jewish musicians also for a good deal of time. So Jewish musicians would um, play forbidden music, <laughs> American or Jewish writers. And whenever the uh, Nazi censors would would come uh, in, then there would be a secret sign, a secret bell that was rung to alarm the musicians. And they would quickly turn over a leaf in their their, um, notebook and play something aloud, some some German music. So to to have some artifact, like a clarinet uh, from uh, from those those times would be be very nice. Mm. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Travels Through Time today. It's been an absolute pleasure and I strongly encourage listeners to go and read um, this book. It's such an extraordinary story. Thank you very much for having me. That was me, Artemis Irvin, speaking to Ronan Steinker about his new book, Anna and Dr. Helmy, How an Arab Doctor Saved a Jewish Girl in Hitler's Berlin. You can find out more about this episode and any of our others by heading over to our website at tttpodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next week.